but definitely thank you for attending. We are going to be talking about regulation today. And the topic of our conversation is regulatory cooperation and coherence, the new frontiers in trade and investment. For my panel today, we have several esteemed uh, guests. I will ask them to introduce themselves before speaking. We do have Bernard Herkman, who's a professor and director of global economics at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute. Rufus Yerksa is the president of the National Foreign Trade Council. William Burke White is a professor and director at Perry World House, University of Pennsylvania. Javier Seuba is a senior lecturer at the Center for International Intellectual Property Studies at the University of Strasbourg. And last but not least, we have Sherry Stephenson, who is a senior fellow at the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development. Thank you, panelists. Our topic today, as I said, is on regulation. Um, we have heard a lot of conversation during the past couple of days on some of the issues related to regulation in the global system, but also at the domestic level. And this panel really seeks to understand, help us understand what is happening, what some of the trends are, and how best to use regulatory systems within the trade system as a whole. On that note, I would like to ask Bernard to start our conversation. And afterwards, we will go down the line and have the panelists give their views. And then I will pose a few questions, and we will open up to questions in the audience. OK. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, what I'm going to say draws on a lot of uh, background work that has been done partly for the ICTSD uh, E15 exercise and partly the kind of research that I've been doing at the European University Institute. So if you want more details, uh, have a look at our website at the EUI. You will find quite a bit of material that deals with this issue of regulatory cooperation and interface with trade agreements. And basically, once we start thinking about dealing with the trade costs that are associated with differences in domestic regulatory regimes, we're really talking about a very different type of uh, beast than when we're talking about tariffs and negotiating down tariffs. Reciprocally, um, whether it's in regional trade agreements or whether it's in the LBTO. So essentially, a large part of what this, this discussion and what the, the challenge here is, is to move from the traditional approach that has been taken in trade agreements, which is all about shallow integration, getting rid of borders, barriers at the border, to kind of deeper integration, which really revolves around kind of getting countries to talk about and cooperate on their domestic regulatory regimes, and not so much questioning the basis of those regimes, although that might be part of that uh, exercise, but essentially trying to figure out what actually makes most sense in terms of regulating particular activities to achieve specific objectives. And I think the big challenge for trade negotiators, for trade policy officials, for people who are involved in trade agreements, <laughs> is to have a credible answer to the question, why in the world are you guys dealing with regulatory issues when in fact we have regulatory communities, we of course have regulators, we have a process, a domestic process that defines what our objectives are, whether it's health, safety, protection of the environment, whatever. And I would argue that the trade community has not done a particularly good job at making a clear and compelling case that actually dealing with some of these issues in the context of a trade agreement will actually help regulators achieve their objectives. Right, so the narrative tends to be one of, we've gotten rid of tariffs, we have much less in the way of trade restrictions around the world. Increasingly, companies confront costs associated with differences in regulatory regimes. So we need to get these regulatory barriers, we need to get these regulatory trade costs down. And I think that is not particularly useful when we're talking to people who really worry about the achievement of regulatory objectives and we kind of see this as, oh, this is another exercise in a race to the bottom. Effectively, what you guys are talking about is domestic deregulation because you think regulation is costly and therefore should disappear. And I think that's really one of the big tensions. And I would argue as a European sitting in Europe and having watched the TTIP discussions and debates, that is really a big challenge for people in the trade world 
to actually say, okay, how can, and I would argue that we need to move away from the narrative of getting rid of barriers and trade costs under the heading of regulation <coughs> towards one where we change that discussion to one saying we all recognize that we have perfectly legitimate domestic regulatory objectives. That's gone through a system of process to which we define those things. And really then the challenge for the trade people is to say, okay, we can actually help through trade agreements, through common rules, through disciplines, through cooperation, dialogue, what have you, we can actually hit two targets with essentially one instrument, which is we can actually improve our regulatory systems and the outcomes of regulation by cooperating, and at the same time, that will actually facilitate uh, matters for business who actually operate internationally. So that, in, in a nutshell, is really where uh, a lot of this research that we've been doing comes down to, and there are some implications for this. So one, I, I think it really needs, you, we kind of collectively need to change the narrative on deep integration and how we actually present that to uh, citizens. So again, I'm an economist, I was involved in some of these TTIP discussions, and the way a lot of that was framed, at least the way the economists uh, kind of try to make the case for TTIP, is to throw all this into economic models and to say, hey, we're going to get a 1% welfare gain or whatever it is that comes out of these models. Unfortunately, it wasn't even close to 1%, it was a lot less. And the bottom line is, we as economists don't really have a good handle on how we actually model these regulatory types of issues and what the net payoff would be from regulatory cooperation. Partly because the only way we can think about this is, is through a cost lens, right? So we're really missing the potential benefits, the dynamic effects, the improved attainment of regulatory objectives, which is not really there, so therefore you can't really have a good discussion around those types of issues if you're, if you're basing your argument on economic analysis and modeling. Um, I think another implication is, as I already mentioned, a much stronger credible commitment. This is not really only about market access, this is about more, and I think that is again part of the narrative. But it's more than a narrative because you also need to put in place the systems that you can actually credibly say, we are not under the regulatory objective. So the European Commission tried that valiantly, I thought, in the debate on TTIP, and once this whole thing exploded. But in a sense, it was too little, too late. You know, the horse had already bolted out of the stable. But I think there are important lessons to be learned there, which we can come back to. Um, All that is not to say that the traditional trade agenda doesn't matter, right? So I think another, and this is my final point, when we're thinking about regulatory dimensions of trade, on the one hand, we have domestic regulation, which is really targeting health, safety, environment, protection objectives. On the other hand, we have regulations which are explicitly designed to discriminate against foreigners, right? So in that sense, that is very much a, uh, an agenda that is alive and well, and that's to a large extent a services agenda. So if you look at the World Bank's services trade restrictedness database or the OECD exercise, which does a similar type of effort in more detail for the OECD countries, what you'll find there actually are still a lot of regulatory real barriers in place, which are really about restricting entry into markets. So another thing that's important to do, and I don't think it's not been done particularly effectively, again, if I draw on the TTIP that experience, is to make that distinction. And if you look at a lot of what was actually being discussed, there was much more of a focus on you know, the chlorine chicken and, and the more regulatory issues that deal with consumer protection and health safety, and not all that much of a focus on regulatory regimes which actually restricted entry to markets, and essentially a lot of those are actually taken off the table from the get-go. So I think we're also getting that sequencing a bit wrong, because if, if there's one area that is trading in this period, you play an important role is actually getting rid of those types of real barriers. So again, that would be another that take away from me in terms of regulatory uh, cooperation, as opposed to actually uh, regulation used as a trade barrier. And that, of course, requires analysis. Right? So you need to be very clear as to what subsets of regulation actually fall into which buckets and which ones you want to pursue, kind of more along the lines of traditional reciprocal bargaining, as opposed to a set of regulatory issues which really do increase costs for business because they're either redundant or duplicative or they're not particularly effective at achieving the underlying objective. But I would argue that requires a different type of discussion, really among the regulators. So what that means for the trade, how trade can help, I would argue that trade agreements could actually help by actually giving a much stronger mandate 
uh, to regulators to actually do that type of cooperation and to give them the resources to do it. Right? So that is again something that often is a constraint for these types of uh, regulatory cooperation uh, initiatives. Let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bernard. Um, it was great to hear your insights on why regulatory cooperation and coherence is increasing, but also some of the tensions. And so I'd like to go to Rufus just to help us understand what role the private sector plays um, in helping shape regulatory frameworks and also some of the challenges that the private sector is facing. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, as someone who uh, both was a WTO official working uh, on this interface between uh, trade policy, trade agreements, and the regulatory world, but also someone who negotiated um, elements of the, the existing system during the Uruguay round, it really, if you think about what we developed at that time, um, much of it was uh, touching on the regulatory process. Uh, if you take something like the services agreement or the SPS agreement in agriculture, um, of how you could reduce the amount of, of uh, trade discrimination uh, and friction between countries, uh, but going deep into the regulatory environment, and of course that does raise many of the questions that Bernard was talking about. Uh, but now I'm working uh, representing a number of US-based uh, companies uh, with a strong interest in promoting uh, international uh, trade and, <coughs> and global cooperation that makes trade easier. And, you know, I'm here with a group of companies in the technology sector, um, companies uh, in the internet economy and e-commerce. And, you know, when you think about some of these companies, I mean, to give you a good example, uh, Google, you know, we all uh, know Google so well, but when you realize it's a 19-year-old company uh, and uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, two graduate students from Stanford who literally started it in their garage, um, you know, Jeff Bezos of Amazon who, you know, got in the car after finishing graduate school, borrowed some money from his parents and drove to California and started this company that we now think of as Mammoth. Or even going back a little earlier, you know, Fred Smith of, of FedEx, who really created the express delivery business, uh, who literally, you know, sort of took his family inheritance and uh, leveraged it to, to get what in today's terms is half a billion dollars in money to start a uh, highly risky business trying to get package delivery uh, from the post office and then turn it into a privatized business. What all of them have in common is they really <coughs> entered into sectors where there were, first of all, relatively low regulatory barriers and uh, where the regulatory framework wasn't well developed. Uh, but secondly, a lot of good ideas and new technologies that uh, people wanted. And, you know, the challenge they had from a business perspective is, you know, there's only so many ways you can make money you can try to drive out your competitors and drive up prices, or you can try to lower costs and offer, uh, you know, things that people think are really, you know, a good bargain and worthwhile. And, and I would say very much in this technology sector, that's been the, the construct. It's been one where um, the regulatory uh, constraints have been relatively low, but now as we move more and more into um, you know, these frontiers of, of, of new uh, technology and the way it's changing economies, changing our industries, changing our societies, there are going to be more demands for um, meeting certain uh, regulatory standards. And so they're very much focused on the, uh, the notion that if you really want to keep costs low for the consumers, uh, if you have overlapping, duplicative, or protectionist uh, regulatory constructs around the world, um, you know, that's going to do two things. It's going to fracture these industries into smaller and smaller subsets where the economies of scale aren't good 
and it's also just going to drive up the costs in individual markets. And a, and a classic case of this, for example, is um, data storage, um, the free flow of data. Uh, you know, in a digital economy where so much of how you deliver products and what you're able to give people depends on data. And in fact, more and more in the manufacturing realm. Well, to bring that all back to the regulatory issues from, from businesses' perspective, I think more and more, um, you know, the smart leaders in the business world realize that um, they don't want to really be seen as trying to drive regulation out of uh, the, the, the sort of social fabric of the countries in which they do business. Because regulations exist normally to, first of all, protect consumers, to protect the economy, uh, to ensure the smooth functioning of society. The question is, can it be smart regulation and it, can it be regulation that doesn't create this fracturing of, uh, of the global economy. And that, that's really what a lot of them are focused on. Uh, you know, you may have heard that there's a group of countries here that are going to announce, I think today, uh, a working, uh, uh, some kind of a working group effort in Geneva to focus on uh, these issues in e-commerce and in the digital economy. Um, mm -hmm. Something along the lines of what was done with um, telecommunications and financial services after the end of the Uruguay round, I, I think that's mm -hmm. you know got a great deal of promise. Uh, it, it is going to be done on a voluntary basis by countries, in other words, governments that want to come into that discussion. Um, I see it as a really um, a groundbreaking uh, step. In, um, among a large group of WTO countries. I, I've heard that there could be 60 or 70 countries signing on to this today. So that, you know, if you think about building on what was done in the uh, Uruguay round and the creation of the WTO in the services sector, for example, but even also in, in technical regulations and, uh, and in areas like food safety, it's not to suggest that you don't have lots of latitude as a government to still create um, the right kinds of regulations and maintain high regulatory standards. I think all advanced economies now expect high standards and more and more developing countries want to see their economies develop on the basis of you know, high standards. But standards which can be more coherent and more interconnected with the rest of the world. I think that's the challenge we have, and, and that's why it's so important to have institutions like not, not just the WTO, but other institutions in, in, uh, in the uh, panoply of international organizations that can help promote that, uh, that mentality. Great. Thank you so much, Rufus. So in sum, I mean, technology is definitely pushing the bounce. Um, in regulation and otherwise, and low regulatory barriers and demand will obviously keep the market moving. However, for us to get to an ideal balance between uh, regulation and the market, we will need to figure out a balanced regulatory system, which for me brings into the question um, of the role of politics. And to help us understand the political environment around regulatory cooperation, uh, Bill will walk us through a few points and just to understand how the politics really does affect um, regulatory reform. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I come at this as both an international lawyer and a political scientist. And I'll probably put on more of my political scientist hat for, for a moment. And the basic point I want to make in, in the next five minutes is that multilateralizing, particularly globalizing, uh, regulatory cooperation uh, is politically very, very hard, and if we think uh, uh, normal trade negotiations are hard, uh, regulation is in many ways even harder. Um, and I think that is largely because the sovereignty costs of regulatory cooperation uh, are uh, even greater than they are in the trade space. By sovereignty costs here, essentially I'm referring to uh, the uh, 
freedom of action that a national government has to give up uh, or its divergence from its preferred course of action. Um, and we see this in the regulatory space in a number of different ways. The first I would simply refer to as regulatory sovereignty, the uh, right of a national government to determine uh, the regulatory system and structures that pertains uh, on its territory or in its uh, economy. And as you think about the different ways one can achieve regulatory coherence, uh, you can see how this bumps into national sovereignty so directly. Um, one way to, to get to regulatory coherence uh, is to develop regulations that have a similar effect, but that requires, of course, national governments uh, to agree both on uh, what a, a basic outcome should be and what processes to get there are acceptable. Uh, or finding some sort of middle ground in your regulations, but that will mean either adding regulations, subtracting regulations, or finding different processes that, again, requires a pretty fundamental shift of national regulatory structures. Or finally, finding mechanisms um, to treat or recognize difference in regulation. And that, too, uh, requires an acceptance by national authorities of some other national authority uh, making what will be deemed as legitimate regulatory choices. Um, and so uh, in all of these spaces, what it really points to is moving from simply agreeing on an outcome to agreeing on recognizing or legitimating other countries national processes. And when you get from outcome to process, uh, it stabs at the heart of sovereignty in an even more powerful uh, and challenging way. And I think what we're seeing in this space uh, is the judgment of national process. Um, and we've seen this, uh, particularly in investment law, uh, as really the heart of the pushback on investment law. And I think the more uh, we attempt to achieve multilateral uh, regulatory cooperation through the trade space, the more the same uh, challenges that we've seen to the politicization of investment law uh, will creep in uh, here. Um, Finally, on the sovereignty point, uh, ultimately this strikes at process, but it also strikes at values. Um, and that regulatory regimes, at least in theory, are reflective of value choices made by national governments. Um, and what we're going to need is either some flexibility in those value choices uh, or some start to see regulatory fragmentation into separate uh, you know, regulatory subsystems. Where do we go from here? Uh, Bernard, your point on um, uh, the need for communication uh, and trust, uh, I fully endorse. The question is how do we build trust between national governmental systems? And then how do we communicate that uh, to um, uh, individuals? And I think this is a space regulation is so opaque uh, to most um, national uh, uh, popula populations um, that figuring out how we communicate the goals and objectives here to overcome that populist pushback will be critical. Um, and I think finally we have to remember um, that this is a two-level game, uh, as it has always been in the trade space, but one now where the domestic level is becoming ever more important. For a long time, regulation could occur, or regulatory conversations could occur uh, in a kind of black box. Today, national populaces are engaging these questions uh, in ways that I think make it ever harder to overcome um, the political costs that I started with. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Bill. I think taking from that, it's obviously hard to overcome you know, regulatory coherence in one country and much less different countries. So I'd like to hear from you, Sherry, about especially the APEC experience, because there seem to be some positive developments there that other regions can learn from. So I think it would be really helpful if you could just share the APEC experience, what you've seen there that would be beneficial for others to learn from, and also what might not be beneficial for other regions to learn from. Thank you very much, and uh, yes, I, I appreciate the opportunity to contribute because I'm going to be a bit more positive than, than what we've heard so far, and then bring in an example of a grouping of countries, as you suggested, in the Asia-Pacific region, APEC, which has actually done some pretty remarkable things um, in the area of regulatory cooperation, which I think are not very much appreciated today in the world economy, probably because they are a little... Um, not as well known as they could be outside of the Asia Pacific. So I've chosen to focus on this grouping. Um, APEC is really an important grouping of 21 economies. It is not a trade agreement, which is perhaps why we don't discuss it in the context of trade conferences, but it is a, 
a cooperative trade arrangement. And the countries that are involved in this are very, very disparate. They are not like-minded groups of countries necessarily. They range all the way from China, Japan, and the United States to Papua New Guinea. Uh, five of those countries are here in the Western Hemisphere, three are in the Pacific, and the remainder are in East Asia and North Asia. But they're very, very different, and they have different traditions and different, many different languages and many different um, types of regulations. So it's an interesting experiment to see what they've been able to do. And I've been working with the APEC process since 1993 or four, so I've been able to observe them <laughs> over a long period of time. Um, I think that APEC has really contributed to forwarding the agenda and providing really good examples of many of the things that our trade experts, Bernard and others, uh, write about in terms of what is desirable for regulatory coherence and cooperation. And I would say uh, I could underline four more general ones to start with, which are the fact that APEC has promoted a very, very high degree of transparency around regulations. Uh, from the beginning, one of the ways it moves forward is by requiring its member economies to produce individual action plans every year and to submit these so that these documents are there. They contain information on all the new um, economic uh, developments and regulations in these economies and they are available and online. Uh, there are various databases in APEC that contain information on regulations, such as the STAR database on economic regulations affecting services, and the, uh, there's a database on education, higher education services, and so forth. There are numerous of uh, these instruments. Um, Secondly, APEC has encouraged more recently the voluntary reporting of information on structural reforms. And this has been done through an initiative of the APEC Economic Committee, which is one of the central bodies of APEC, and uh, member states have, member economies have voluntarily submitted information on their structural reforms, and they have particularly focused on services in the past two years. And this allows the members to actually understand um, what might be best practices in other member economies, to comment on these, to discuss them, and so forth, without, without um, passing any value judgments, which is very important. APEC doesn't pass value judgments. Um, the third way in which APEC cooperates is, is uh, actually a really important way and uh, one that's always been recommended but is really not done in many other areas or groupings that I know of, and that is by involving regulators into uh, some of its working groups and working bodies. And this is the case uh, particularly for the working groups in the services area, telecommunications, tourism, energy, um, transport, where regulators meet uh, together with trade officials and often and industry representatives to discuss the structure and design of regulations and how they're implemented and how they could be improved in terms of their performance. I think this is unique to APEC. Um, regulators have oft also been involved in another mechanism that APEC has developed recently, uh, well, fairly recently, 2013, in the for goods, and this is, uh, has a complicated name, so I'm going to um, look up the name. It's called the APEC um, ARCAM, APEC Regulatory Cooperation Advancement Mechanism on Trade-Related Standards. And this is a very interesting um, development in APEC because the member economies select a regulatory issue that they think may be problematic for trade, and then they agree to discuss it in a dialogue in which they invite regulators and industry representatives to discuss this issue so that it does not become a technical barrier to trade. And they started these dialogues in 2011 with a discussion on the interoperability of smart grid standards. So this has been an interesting process to observe. Um, in addition to involving regulators, APEC also has developed certain instruments that help its member economies sort of nudge them in the same direction, which is what you indicated, uh, in terms of developing uh, regulations that might not be identical, but might have the same desired effect. And they've been doing this through the adoption of principles, regulatory principles, uh, 
and through the adoption of a checklist on regulatory reform, which was developed jointly with OECD, so it's an APEC OECD checklist on regulatory reform, and encouraging the member economies, of course all of this is voluntary, to observe these principles, adopt them, and apply them when they put uh, their regulations into effect, when they revise their regulations and implement them. Um, and currently, APEC is developing a set of nine binding principles on domestic regulation of services. So I think all of these taken together have had some impact. There are two high major success stories that are always cited in terms of regulatory cooperation for APEC, so I should mention them to you. The first is the APEC business travel card, and that was one of the very early initiatives of APEC, begun in 1997, as uh, among a small group of economies and has now expanded to include all APEC members with the US and Canada as transitional members. And this business travel card allows all the business people who apply and obtain it to travel visa-free, I mean without obtaining a visa each time, just on the basis of the card, and uh, without any other fees or administrative burdens, and to have special lanes for processing uh, and immigration at uh, major airports in APEC economies. And it's been estimated that this has saved the business people in the region a considerable amount of time and money. Um, so that's one success story. The second one is a more recent development of what uh, is known as the APEC privacy framework and the APEC privacy rules within this framework. And this is a very notable effort which the APEC economies um, all agreed upon and endorsed in order to ensure that privacy does not become a barrier to e-commerce. So these privacy, this privacy framework basically has nine principles and these nine principles are all um, set out to ensure that, al that although privacy is respected for individual information and data, in, it is not uh, used as a barrier to uh, e-commerce trade. So the proof will be in the pudding to see if this is uh, effective and perhaps if this could serve as some of the input into the e-commerce discussions uh, that may, or negotiations that may be launched now uh, in the WTO. Um, why has APEC been successful? in these areas. I think it's remarkable that it has been, um, at least from my perspective, has done very, very interesting, useful, and uh, positive things for its very diverse set of member economies. And I think it's because of three very quick reasons. One is that it is not a negotiated trade agreement. So its member economies don't feel threatened to discuss substantive issues, which is one of the huge problems we've seen in the WTO, where every time uh, a WTO member intervenes, it is taken on record as a negotiating position of its member, uh, of its economy, or its country. So this, uh, yesterday we heard Minister Malcora say that one of the biggest disconnects in WTO is between what members want to do and the fact they cannot discuss substantive issues. And this is a very different situation from that of other international fora um, in where progress has been made, such as the Paris Agreement environment and the uh, 2030 agenda. So APEC is able to discuss these substantive issues because its member economies don't feel threatened, including bringing regulators and trade officials together. Um, secondly, it's because from the beginning APEC has had Ecotech or economic and technical cooperation, which is really what we call capacity building as one of its three fundamental pillars. So this has allowed the lesser developed APEC members to know that there will be workshops and training programs available for them to help bring them up to speed on whatever decision APEC members decide to carry out. And this has been a consistent part of APEC's work and continues to this day. And the third reason is that um, Basically, APEC from the beginning has also incorporated the views of the private sector. It has had a mechanism for uh, the private sector representatives in the form of ABAC, the APEC Business Advisory Council, to observe APEC's meetings and to provide input and guidance into its work so that its work has always been grounded in a business reality that has made it, whatever it does, much more relevant to actual exporters on the ground. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Um.
So I come from, um, kind of like Bill, I kind of wear several hats, but I come also from the financial services regulatory perspective. And there have been some great, um, there has been great coherence compared to other sectors. And so looking at financial services as one of the more positive examples, I'd like to tap into Javier just to understand what's happening within the pharmaceutical sector and whether there are similar challenges as we've heard in the case of agriculture or whether it's moving towards the route of financial services or whether there are new lessons to be learned in general. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. And uh, it is a pleasure sharing this uh, panel with all of you. In fact, farm harmonization is a fascinating area for uh, many different reasons. Some of them have been mentioned before, for instance, in the intervention of uh, William, when he was mentioning these uh, national choices, values, uh, the aspects raised before by Rufus Yersha relating to costs. Now, uh, Sherry, when she was commenting on the participation of the private sector, all this uh, takes place within the farm domain. So what I will do is to briefly uh, introduce the current scenario and uh, then to address two contemporary uh, initiatives that are taking place uh, nowadays. So presently one can identify three different layers of uh, pharmaceutical organization uh, taking place. Uh, one of these is a very typical one, uh, the classic uh, uh, action of an international organization, the World Health Organization and its expert committees that regularly adopt uh, guidelines, instructions for national authorities. A second layer of uh, cooperation takes place uh, between uh, national authorities, even sometimes in the regional context, and they give place to this sort of uh, global administrative law, uh, whereby these national authorities uh, well, contact, interact, and develop uh, common understandings with respect to technical uh, guidelines for pharma products. And the third layer, and I would say that probably the most interesting one in terms of novelty, is the involvement of the private sector. So the creation of private and public partnerships solely devoted to pharmaceutical standardization. Uh, namely, this is the case of the International Council on Harmonization. In this respect, that, uh, while the uh, activity of uh, national authorities at the national and regional level is very intense, uh, the, the rising prominence of the International Council of Harmonization uh, is taking central place, and I think that it is particularly important from the systemic point of view. Um, the ICH is unique in bringing together parts of the industry and part of the main players uh, in the international uh, pharmaceutical uh, policy domain. These are the, the regulators of the US, the EU, and Japan. And well, together they adopt the standards, develop the standards that are later on going to be implemented by them and by others as well. So, and before continuing with the ICH, I would also like to, to draw some uh, reflections on uh, regulatory harmonization taking place in free trade agreements because pharmaceutical organization is also taking place in this context, sometimes in a quite uh, foreseeable manner, in TBT chapters, but on some other occasions as well in uh, unexpected chapters, such as the uh, intellectual property chapter. Uh, in this case, pharmaceutical standardization uh, and by means of different normative techniques, such as direct regulation, transplantation, uh, legislation by reference, is also having a prominent role in these uh, free trade agreements. For instance, the definition of pharmaceutical product. This definition has a tremendous importance when it comes to uh, identify the scope and reach of uh, the regulation. If we pay attention to the recent agreement between Canada and the EU, we will find the definition of pharmaceutical product in two different chapters. One devoted to uh, intellectual property and in one annex devoted exclusively to good manufacturing practices. So the level of sophistication is uh, increasing and becoming uh, more and more uh, specific. And uh, likewise, as it happens in uh, intellectual property and probably in other areas, uh, this legislation by transplantation is also taking place. For instance, we will find uh, excerpts, parts of the European Code on medicines 
in new agreements, for instance, uh, in the agreement with the CETA, but also in the uh, proposed agreement to the Mercosur. Uh, let's see what happens with this, but they are part of the uh, EU pharmaceutical uh, code. Well, the reasons are clear. Before the TTIP was mentioned, just to, to, to make a very long story short, the benefits in economic terms of uh, pharmaceutical harmonization between the EU and the US, uh, according to some economic studies, amounted to 11.3%. So if we compare this benefit with uh, eventual tariff cuts, this was much hard, uh, larger. Um, so this is the reason why the, the, the center of uh, these uh, agreements uh, has shifted probably from tariffs to regulatory aspects. So I don't know if you can call any more free trade agreements. Maybe we should start thinking about regulatory harmonization agreements. So now, uh, very briefly, I will go back to the International Council of Harmonization, uh, which is a very relevant initiative for different reasons. First, because uh, it's reached an impact. The ICH, uh, or the states promoting ICH uh, uh, and the harmonization by means of ICH, represent 90% of the value of the pharmaceutical uh, market globally. And not only this, uh, some other states follow uh, either explicitly or de facto the guidance adopted by the ICH. And another aspect that makes the ICH so uh, prominent and, and interesting is the nature of the uh, guidance it adopts. In some occasions, uh, it has been particularly emphasized the quality of the guidance. So it is also, uh, it is very difficult to find someone that will challenge the quality of these guidance. But there will be some that will say, well, but from the ethical point of view, maybe some of these guidelines are contentious for emerging and developing economies. We can discuss this uh, later in stage. And next, and, and also very important in this context, because of the potential of these guidelines to become technical barriers to trade for non-participating states. So this is the reason why membership uh, of the ICH becomes so important. So who drafts and who endorses these guidelines? Up until October 2015, only innovative industry associations and only the regulatory authorities of the US, the EU and Japan were part of this uh, initiative. So together they studied and adopted the guidelines that would be uh, applicable in their uh, countries but also would influence the legislation in our countries. So this was the key characteristic of the ICH, you know, that uh, it did not count with other major players. The lack probably of inclusiveness is the key aspect that should be addressed. Uh, what happens with major uh, pharma producers, let's say India or Brazil, uh, what happens with other producers uh, of, let's say, generic uh, drugs, what happens with uh, scientific organizations. So there are a number of stakeholders that have not been until now, uh, being involved in a very active uh, way in the ICH. So uh, this is uh, probably what I will leave my presentation, just by underlining that in 2015, by the end of 2015, a major uh, change took place in the ICH, and uh, this has to do with the future of harmonization, and I will probably leave this for my second round of interventions. Thank you, Javier. Um, I'll go ahead and go into the Q&A session and I think I'll jump off your last point of inclusion and this is a question for the whole panel. How can we ensure that moving forward as we seek to achieve regulatory coherence um, we do make sure there is an inclusive process whether that is with LDCs, whether it is with private sector or SMEs within the private sector um, just to make sure that everyone's um, opinions are heard and on the table. As Bill said, there is this tension going on right now with uh, populist movements and people not really understanding where governments and in particular regulators and lawmakers want to lead them. And so how can we improve the conversation and make sure different types of groups um, are included to make sure that we do achieve regulatory coherence? So it's open to the whole panel. 
Well, I'll, I can j jump in, and, and, and you called me called me out on the populism side. I, I actually um, am going to give what might sound a little counterintuitive answer to that, because usually the way you increase inclusion is formalize processes and get everyone a seat at the table. Um, but building on my, my sort of concerns uh, about the sovereignty costs of regulatory coherence, there are some benefits, inclusion benefits, to depoliticization and informality because those actually drive less at the heart of sovereignty costs. They require perhaps less or fewer, I should say, uh, concessions from national governments. And even while things like transgovernmental regulatory networks, standards, and soft law might appear to be opaque and non-inclusive, they're things that anyone can join into and engage uh, without having to necessarily go the full measure of uh, accepting a process. Um, secondly, um, I think the more effort we can put into mutual recognition of different regulatory process rather than absolute regulatory harmonization. That creates more room for difference, uh, and more room for difference um, certainly opens up the table. And finally, I come back to the point of trust, figuring out how to build trust between uh, and, and among uh, governments, government institutions, and national populace, uh, I think also serves that inclusory goal. So, Rufus? Yeah, so I, I was going to say that, first of all, I, I very much agree on, on APEC that, you know, the, the kinds of mechanisms that they've been able to develop in the mm -hmm. APEC framework have been really a good way for regulators to communicate with each other and to develop a kind of a common knowledge of what are the regulatory objectives they're all trying to achieve? How much do they have differing objectives and how much do their objectives coincide? And, you know, a number of my companies have been very involved in that because they see a real opportunity to work with a community of regulators around the table. And very often when you do get regulators together, you start to, you know, you start to realize that they have similar objectives, but their systems evolve differently, as, as Bill was saying, and, and uh, they actually learn from the best practices of the others around the table. There are some big problems, though, when you think about large uh, economies versus smaller countries. I mean, I remember <coughs> when the uh, intellectual property authorities in, in in Costa Rica were trying to explain to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office that the entire government of Costa Rica at that time was not that much bigger in terms of bureaucracy than the Patent and Trademark Office was in the U.S. So the challenges for them to have the same degree of regulatory um, complexity are very great. The other thing I was going to say is that you know the WTO is, I mean it, it is important to have agreements and to have system of agreements which deal with not so much mechanisms to create regulatory cooperation or coherence, you know, the basic baseline they try to set is to prevent the use of regulatory standards or processes to discriminate or to create unjustified barriers to trade. Now that's a delicate line to draw and it's been difficult in many areas. But to me, it's not a substitute for what people here have been talking about. How can we use mutual recognition in, in a way that is, is useful? And by the way, that whole process of mutual recognition actually, in order to achieve that, you have to have the regulators communicating with each other and working together and understanding each other's systems better. So when you think about an automobile, for example, you know, you have very different regulatory standards in different markets. But what does the consumer want? The consumer wants to know that no matter which country they go to, if they get into an automobile, you know, it's going to have some of, you know, basic regulatory protections in terms of safety and in terms of um, its use. So, you know, I think as we move towards more, um, global integration if we don't have mechanisms like APEC and if we can't replicate that in other economies around the world, um, it's going to end up harming consumers in the final analysis. Do you want Bernard or? Bernard? I'd like to say something. 
follow up a little bit. So I think in terms of how you phrase the question in terms of making sure this is an inclusive process, I think at the end of the day, this is very difficult to do, uh, precisely for all the reasons that have already been mentioned. But I think it's, it's worth thinking about kind of cutting up the universe and putting things into different buckets. So some things actually do lend themselves to international standardization and harmonization. Right, so the trade facilitation agreement is an example where at the end of the day everybody kind of agreed on what actually makes sense to do to facilitate trade. And different countries have different capacities and that agreement I think has a very good approach towards dealing with that reality. But at the end of the day everybody kind of agreed on this makes sense, this is good practice. So then you could say, okay, this is an example of regulatory coherence at work. But I think in a lot of areas that's not going to be necessarily feasible to do. So then we are in this world of recognition and equivalence. And I think there we just need to recognize that that's not going to be feasible to do with a very large number of countries. So I think there the key really is to ensure that these processes are open in the sense that everybody knows what is being done in a particular context. And that there's also a discussion that identifies what, it actually, what is necessary to ensure that regulators A and B will actually regard regulatory agency C as being equivalent. And that is very much, as Bill and others have said, that's very much about the process, that's very much about how these systems actually work. It's not necessarily about a particular standard or a particular uh, approach towards certification. You have to have that notion that the systems are equivalent and moving towards the same goal. And again, that is not something that is going to be feasible with a large number of countries from the get-go, so you have to build up systems where you can actually kind of extend that over time. And as Sherry said, link that to the provision of assistance for countries that want to do it. But, you know, that's, uh, that's a long haul. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, am I mic Yes. Thank you. I, your question is thought-provoking. And when I thought about it, I, I took your question in terms of con inclusion as to how to foster the most inclusive growth on one hand, economic, and the, on the other hand, uh, inclusive participation in the design of policies. So if, and this would, I'm going to take the national level because Bernard has discussed the, the international cooperation level. So at the national level, I think fostering inclusive growth really needs to be done through the way regulatory instruments are designed. And that's very important. And a lot of, um, there are different reasons for regulatory interventions in a domestic economy. Some of them are to address market failures. Uh, some of them are to address externalities. Some of them are to address information asymmetries. And there's another category, which is to achieve public policy objectives. And those objectives are objectives around inclusive growth, to foster inclusive growth. And they include, for example, universal service obligations, so that all segments of society are included in the provision of a specific service that is really one considered to be one of the uh, essential um, qualities of, of human life, telecom. And now we've extended this even to access to the internet. So I think that those regulatory instruments, we know what they are, it depends on the context, it depends upon the economy in which they are de you know, designed and in which they are carried out, but they could include cross allowing firms to cross-subsidize, they could include requirements for having build-out of certain kind of facilities in rural areas where they otherwise would not exist and so forth. You can direct the behavior of firms through regulations if you want to uh, promote inclusive growth. So I would say that's one category of how regulations can be used to promote inclusive growth, is through designing them to achieve public policy objectives which are based around inclusiveness. The second way which I think one could look at inclusiveness is how do you allow all different stakeholders to participate in the design and the regulatory process itself? to um, basically have a voice as to how regulations are formulated and then a voice in how effective they are when they're implemented. Maybe, you know, it didn't have the impact that it was expected to have. And there you need public processes that allow stakeholders to voice their views and um, either written or in person or 
over the internet so that regulators can take these views into account and adjust accordingly. And appropriate regulations are not set in stone forever. They are reviewed and should be reviewed on a periodic basis and part of that review process should be an open, inclusive call for um, input. Following on, uh, following on inclusiveness, um, probably we can distinguish three different layers uh, or three different aspects that should be addressed when thinking about inclusiveness. So, so the, the legal uh, aspect, the, the technical aspect, and also a third layer that I think that is important nowadays. Before, because of this uh, populism and uh, these trends that uh, occupy everyone. So, when it comes to the legal uh, aspect, inclusiveness, if we think about the TBT agreement and how is it framed, so if we want these standard setting organizations, the ICH for instance, the one that I mentioned, to become truly global, to become truly inclusive, uh, other states not participating actually should be invited to participate at the same level. So this is not reality the case nowadays because we have three different of uh, memberships, different types of memberships to this uh, organization, and different members have different rights. Uh, when it comes to the more technical uh, domain, the participation of the industry is also vital. The industry has some of the information that others uh, have no access to. They develop science, uh, they develop new techniques, they develop some type of very valuable information that has to be shared, has to be uh, we'll say, uh, managed uh, with uh, public institutions at the same time. So answering to technical complexity involves inclusion of the private sector as well. But the private sector will not be alone because then, if we did this, we will follow in the trap of uh, the, I would say, this uh, repetitive uh, discourse of populist movements that this is something done by some for some. If we want to avoid that, we have as well to democratize, in a way, this type of standard setting organizations. And how we can do that? We can do that by inviting uh, scientific organizations, for instance, inviting some states in some specific aspects, consumer organizations as well. So there are many different things that have to be done at the legal, at the technical, and I would say at the uh, inclusiveness uh, level. Great, thank you. Um, on that note, I would like to open up to the audience so that we can have a conversation. Okay, I see one question there. But I think in the meantime that we're waiting. Okay, great, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Isa Lejarraga from the OECD. And thank you to the panel for this very interesting discussion. Um, I had two questions on the issue of regulatory discrimination and regulatory differences. As Bernard Hockman said, both the World Bank and the OECD have an STRI, a Services Trade Restrictiveness Index. And basically, this is a database and an index that collects information on regulatory barriers in services and measures them. Uh, one distinctive feature of the OECD STRI is that it includes both discriminatory and non-discriminatory regulatory barriers. And we find that uh, many, if not most, of the barriers and the most restrictive barriers are non-discriminatory regulatory barriers. And we also find that it's very difficult um, to identify discrimination, because often discrimination is not de jure, but de facto it is. And so, what are your thoughts about, uh, yesterday we talked about protectionism, and it was, um, um, the issue of discrimination was identified as a core um, criterion for protectionism. So, what do we do about non-discriminatory barriers? And the other is that the emphasis in regulatory cooperation is always on regulatory differences. And when we talk to investors, investors don't generally invest in 90 countries. They generally invest in a few countries and it's a long-term investment. It's a bit different than a trade decision that can be reversed, an export decision that can be reversed. An investment decision can often not be reversed in, for 20 years. So something that investors ask us is, for regulatory consistency. They want a regulatory regime to be locked in for 20 years. And that is as important or more than regulatory differences across countries. Um, so how, how do we measure and how do we discuss uh, regulatory consistency? 
I, I could listen address the, the second the second question is, is obviously is a big challenge and it comes the same uh, type of questions when we think about investment uh, treaties lateral investment treaties when it comes non violation complaints in the context of intellectual property uh, but I, I don't know to what extent the discussion is different at the international and at the national level because in some areas uh, some uh, technical complex areas uh, where scientific advances uh, advances take place, it's very difficult to lock regulation for 20 years. So some scope for uh, public policy, or important scope for public policy changes, has to be uh, allowed. Otherwise, uh, all countries, including the countries of origin of investment, will be also uh, locked and will not uh, change their, their uh, national regimes. Uh, obviously, I understand that the investor point of view is it will be ideal if we knew that things would be the same in 20 years, but in some specific areas, at least uh, when it comes to areas such as pharma, but also chemicals and other, uh, probably investors have also to cope with uh, scientific advantage. Any other comments? Uh, thank you, Isa. Those are really challenging questions, and you have done an enormous amount of work at the OEC in the STRI database. is a fabulous tool for researchers and for policymakers, and I know how difficult it was to put it all together. Um, and I think one of the most valuable aspects is, in fact, that you did try to encompass all aspects of me all measures that had a potentially uh, protectionist impact, including the non-discriminatory ones, and that is a huge challenge. Uh, you asked how to deal with that. Well, it's very challenging. <laughs> it's, it's not an easy question um, because on paper a measure can look non-discriminatory and in reality it can have a protectionist impact. So it's one of the most thorny issues in international trade. I personally think the only way to get around that is to examine the impact of these regulations in dialogues and in actual practice, exactly sort of along the lines that APEC has been doing when it has been bringing the regulators, the industry representatives, and the trade officials together. Probably we need the consumers too, um, but they're not often as aware of you know, the impact of these uh, measures as firms are because they have to export and deal with them directly. So I think the best way is to throw as much transparency on the actual impact of the measure as possible. And the only way and the best way to do this is through discussing them. And discussing them in a framework that is not threatening. So I really do uh, commend like reading some of the reports of the um, working groups, uh, the sectoral working groups in APEC on the services, the transport, telecom, energy, and so forth, to see how they have dealt with these issues and discuss them in the groups. But other than that, I think that's the whole purpose behind the chapter on regulatory coherence that is now in the TPP and will remain that is in the TPP and I think is one of the big, big positive advances of the TPP is this chapter on regulatory coherence. And I think its precise purpose is to deal not just with de jure protectionist measures, but to be able to bring the member economies together, well, in this case member par parties to the agreement together, so they actually can discuss um, the impact of a regulation, any regulation discriminatory, non-discriminatory, on the ground, and see how to deal with it and what to do with it, um, and hopefully help them design regulations or somehow craft them that, or implement them in a way that will be um, not overtly, not, not protectionist in their impact. And I think the chapter on regulatory coherence is a direct result of APEC's work on regulatory cooperation. And so I'm really excited to see how that chapter works in practice. Yeah, I, I very much agree with, with those points. I, I think that, um, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, you find that there are far fewer uh, discriminatory than non-discriminatory uh, barriers, but your, I think your point was that a lot of the so-called non-discriminatory barriers, um, you know, there is a great deal of de facto discrimination. And I think the explanation for all that is, is fairly clear. I mean, we do have 
-hmm. pretty clear standards in the agreements about discrimination and ability of um, you know, an organization like the WTO or, or a judicial system like the WTS to identify the real, you know, clear cases of de facto discrimination. But that then creates two problems. Governments become very creative in writing, uh, you know, facially non-discriminatory standards and things like that that, that actually have uh, a discriminatory effect. The other thing is, let's face it, the bigger and more powerful the country is in terms of its economic size, um, it, you know, the size of its market, the size of its um, government and its regulatory <laughs> capacity or capacity to make regulations, the more creative they can be about doing this. Um, and so it isn't surprising to see that some of the most problematic regulations are really are in the big countries. Um, mm. You know, whereas smaller countries maybe, you know, they, they pay a price for having that mm. discrimination because they don't, they yeah. can't necessarily um, produce everything their consumers need. They need access to, you know, to global um, sources of, of, of products and services. And I think particularly in the services sector, that's, that's becoming a lot clearer. So what do we do about it? I mean, I, I, first of all, organizations like OECD, um, you've talked about the APEC cooperation. Uh, hopefully, TPP someday is going to come into effect and it's going to have a, a, a positive impact on all of this. Actually, even in the NAFTA context, there have been real uh, yes. improvements among the North American um, regular, regulators in, in a whole variety of, of uh, different areas. Um, and that's to me is you know regional structures, but also with an eye on not ending up with big um, you know blocks, uh, trading blocks that that would foster a kind of um, regulatory competition. Uh, they see some advantages in in, uh, in gaining you know some protection for their industries. Um, so. It, you know, important to have um, these supra-regional uh, types of structures. And if you think about APEC, that's what it is because it has an awful lot of um, both uh, Asian and um, Western Hemisphere participants. Um, I'll actually add on just a little bit to that. And from the East African community perspective, I think there is a lot of opportunity in cases where countries are not yet regulatory advanced to really, one, just move innovation in business. And I think that in the meantime, that whether it's East Africa or a lot of other developing countries, I think it's a great opportunity to start engaging as private sector with regulators to show them examples of what has been done in other parts of the world and have them understand what is possible through regulatory reform. And some of the work I've been doing is on regulatory sandboxes and reg tech and just helping regulators understand that technology can actually help them do their job. And that even though there is a lag between what investors want or what you know innovation will do, they can start thinking faster than they typically have in the past. That's good. Hello, um, my name's Alison Hook. I'm a, a consultant on professional services regulation. Um, and uh, there are a couple of things. So a couple of things that um, I observe in relation to trade agreements which slightly concern me. One is that um, certainly with the industries that I deal with and predominantly lawyers, when we get to, when we're participating in discussions about a, a trade agreements, whether they're FTAs or, 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 or whatever, there is often the barrier of fed negotiating with federal countries, and in particular the US, where the USTR says, you know, constitutionally, we can't do anything. We can't actually commit anything at a state level, which is where a lot of the regulation is. And so that creates a, an, an, an initial sort of limitation on the benefit of trade agreements for in particular professional services which are regulated, at, tend to be regulated at a sub-national level. The, the second point is that even where professional services, for example, regulation gets included in a trade agreement, and I'm thinking in particular of the EU-Canada um, free trade agreement that was signed recently, that, um, 
has a, a chapter in it which basically says we're delegating back, you know, mutual recognition, delegate back to the professional services regulators to get amongst themselves, discuss, whatever. The problem with that is that um, most regulators, if left to their own devices, will quite happily say, let's agree amongst ourselves to keep things exactly the way they are. Um, because they are by nature risk averse and tend not to want to be pushed. So I guess, you know, my, my first question is how do we overcome the federal issue in bringing regulation into trade agreements more? And the second thing is how do we get dialogue plus teeth? Because, you know, regulators by their very nature um, in the industries that I deal with tend to be very, very reluctant to change anything and need a bit of stimulation from outside, which is more than simply saying, get together and agree something. And I'll, I'll take the, the first question on the federal system. Uh, though I'm, I'm not a U.S. constitutional lawyer, uh, I, I don't think you're going to see a lot of change in the U.S. constitutional structure that is suddenly going to give the federal government power over uh, states, particularly in, in some of those regulatory domains. It strikes at some of the same sovereignty costs and, and division of powers that I talked about before. I do think, though, that engaging uh, states in international negotiations where the fundamental regulatory question is one that resides at the state level um, actually makes sense. Um, and I would actually love to see uh, joint delegations that do more to engage uh, state legislatures and state regulators um, in those processes. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you, you mentioned in the second part of your question, how do you create the impetus uh, to, to move regulatory, um, regulators forward? I think the same thing is true at the state level. How do you create incentives for state level mm -hmm. regulators to move in the sort of broader general trajectory of at least sort of the, the direction that I think we would mostly define as, as the right direction, uh, and I think it's dialogue and inclusion are, are the only two answers I can give you. I second that. I think that dialogue and inclusion, but dialogue around perhaps some guiding principles is always very useful. Dialogue just, you know, in to have coffee is not very useful, but I think that's why APEC has developed precisely these principles and this checklist so that when, you know, these dialogues happen, there's something around which they can actually discuss. And I think the key here is not necessarily, again, that the regulations have to be identical, but that with different regulations, you achieve the same result, you move in the same direction. The professional sector is particularly pernicious because n very few governments want to regulate from the top down. They want to have the professional bodies determine who is competent to practice because they are the ones who have specialized in this area. Governments are not doctors, governments are not dentists, governments are not veterinarians, and so forth. So, I mean, I think at the federal level, so I think that's the, you know, the, the tricky part about it. You want to have the professionals determine who is competent, but of course it does leave, that system leaves itself open to abuse and particularly to to a little bit of, to inaction and um, protectionist tendencies, but you know this is an eternal problem. How do you how do you make it more open? Part of the way you make it more open is by not having um, by the way you recognize equivalencies uh, for professionals from abroad, and part of it is by not having not allowing these. Um, colegios or these professional bodies and associations to introduce any kind of numerous clauses of any kind of, you know, close quotas. So those are two ways at least that you could uh, perhaps intervene from the top without uh, specifying any particular type of, of uh, professional qualification. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, I, I haven't dealt with, I've, I've dealt as a, as a policymaker with the subfederal challenges with trade agreements more in the procurement context than say in the, in the services context. I know that you know when we tried to get the US states to essentially uh, sign into and make commitments under the, the, the WTO uh, government procurement agreement, it was a real challenge. And I think one of the ways we ended up doing it, and I think we finally got 30 some states to to join in was to, um, you know, begin to convince the leg legislatures uh, and the 
politicians in those places that they were actually going to derive a lot of um, benefits because you know it's a way of creating greater competition and, and driving down their budgets. Now the problem with the way something like professional services are regulated is very often you know the the industry itself is regulating itself. That is, the lawyers are creating the regulation, and they have a built-in desire to to maybe be um, protectionist, frankly, um, and that's a big problem. You know, it's why you see I mean, in a state like New York, which maybe is you know I, I'm always amazed at how many foreign lawyers manage to become members of the New York State Bar, but can't become members of the bar for example, in Washington, D.C. or in California. And I think that's in part because New York has also got a lot of lawyers who want to go practice abroad and want, you know, have, are internationally minded. And, and that gets me to your point about, um, you know, by, by definitely having, um, you know, this constant effort at, at dialogue and communication and inclusion will, I hope, help professions like that begin to realize, you know, their customers are now global businesses and the people they're working for have global interests and they, they will. so I went and practiced law in Brussels as an American lawyer in the DC bar and got in, uh, entered into the, the Brussels bar, which by the way is pretty easy to get into if you're an American lawyer anyway. So, uh, you know, I, I hope that that helps to foster that kind of, I don't think you can do it by forcing uh, you know, kind of constitutional change or, or uh, do it, you know, too coercively through trade agreements because it has to be uh, mm -hmm. self-interest that ultimately, I think, drives this. Yes, the, the European counterpoint can also be interesting because you mentioned the U.S., but in Europe there are many areas that have not been communitarized that uh, belong still to the national sovereignties of states. And this is a very clear limit when it comes to negotiating uh, free trade agreements where they can uh, reach an agreement and where they cannot even start negotiations. No? So we have to follow the path of uh, EU uh, harmonization and then we can advance in, in the international context. But to give the, the, the other side of the coin, uh, this is probably a formal and a legalistic answer, but from the point of view of public international law, whatever that uh, uh, asset or so a federal state uh, does is also tells as well the, the responsibility of the state. So the, the limits are formed when you negotiate, but not later on. Uh, the, the state will be responsible anyway. And there's a very quick reaction to your last statement. That uh, It seemed to me that you said that uh, uh, national authorities are reluctant to uh, conduct uh, harmonization of authorities. I, I'm sure that it depends on the sector. But as far as pharmaceutical products are concerned, National authorities have been uh, at the forefront, uh, they have taken the lead uh, to, to promote harmonization, at least some of them, uh, the FDA, the EMA, the, the Japanese authority. Yeah, I was thinking about the question. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay. Good. No, I wanted, sorry, I came, Giorgio Sacerdoti from Milano, I came in late. Um, having followed a little bit the discussion in TTIP uh, and CETA, somehow you, you are making a very abstract picture of uh, regulators trying friendly way to harmonize. I mean, uh, you see the, the, the public opinion in Europe has been very much against in certain fields of good, of sanitary, pharmaceutical, and so to the, even to this cooperation for new standard, they fear that the U.S. will impose on us in Europe a lowering of standard. I don't, I don't share this view, but I mean you have to condemn. And people were in the street against the idea. And one of the points was exactly that. And then you have in Europe this, uh, this diversification between how much to have you to give to the technicians, to the expert, to the regulator. And how much is politics? The European Parliament came in now with a banking standard saying you cannot just impose Basel III or Basel IV to the banks and asking them to raise capital and, and making, putting banks in difficulty. It's for the European Parliament, not for the European Central Bank to decide. And, they, and in other uh, 
more technical standard too. So I, I think there will be a, a serious issue. And even the regulators themselves understand that the, um, the, the Federal Food and Drug uh, Authority in the US is not pleased to have first before uh, allowing a new, developing a new standard to listen if the TTIP would have been in force to what uh, the corresponding European authorities would say, even if afterwards both could be free to enact the standard. And if the standards are different, then this idea of free, uh, more freedom of trade between the two sides of the Atlantic uh, would get lost. So I would like to, to, to listen to your reflections on this, as far as it hasn't been said until now. Can we also take any other questions now? There are any? Okay, we'll have that as the last question. Okay, I, I will just go, I would like just to go back to uh, some previous reflections on inclusiveness. So uh, before we, we made this point on uh, the, the importance on taking into consideration uh, different views, consumer interests, uh, scientific divergent opinions when it comes to harmonization. And, and uh, this uh, was mentioned in the panel as one of the different layers or different challenges that, that uh, harmonization has in front of us, or we have in front of harmonization. So how do you do that? In Europe, uh, you know that the European Parliament has taken center stage uh, when it comes to pass uh, these free trade agreements, including very contentious uh, provisions. And the, the, the key uh, to, to answer to that concern is more transparency and more information and also taking on board uh, experts to discuss the issues. And there is also a, a crucial question that I think that we are not capable to decide. Many of these issues are highly complex and it's very difficult to transmit the message to the wider audience on the, the crucial aspects that uh, many of these discussions involve when it comes to a purity a standard or when it comes to bioequivalence. So these are uh, technical and scientific issues and how you uh, convey the message to the large audience is a, a big challenge and it can be, well, uh, the, the object of uh, manipulation, no doubt. Okay. Um, Do you want to get, um, I don't know if you were here, the gentleman who asked the question when I spoke of, about APEC and the example it offered for regulatory cooperation, but I would simply like to point out that all of the controversy that we've seen in, in Europe and uh, particularly in Europe, some in the United States about, you know, trying to harmonize standards on pharmaceuticals and different products, there hasn't been any people on the streets arguing, you know, demonstrating in APEC meetings, against APEC meetings. There haven't been any of this public controversy expressed in the Asia Pacific. And why is that? I think it's because of the way that APEC has moved forward in the form of regulatory cooperation rather than trying to negotiate harmonization or trying to, you know, negotiate uh, n basically impose kind of one's version of, of what should be an acceptable standard or acceptable um, ways of processing food and so forth and so on. The idea is that in APEC you, you enhance dialogue, you enhance transparency uh, through dialogue, exchange of information and best practices and what you try to, move, to do is move member economies towards the same outcomes. I can't stress that enough. So that regulators don't feel threatened because they're able to retain their own regulatory independence and sovereignty, but they are nudged, which I like that, that word nudge, which is what we, we had in um, the Nobel Prize laureate Richard Thaler in his book, Nudge. You try to nudge uh, your regulators towards a similar outcomes. And I think that this nudging is, uh, is a very effective way that APEC has found to move forward. And I think in the uh, area of regulations, and particularly contentious regulations, it's probably, even though it's a very long-term process, it's probably the most effective way of working. <laughs>
Thank you so much for attending um, our panel and engaging in this very interesting conversation. As we can see, there will continue to be some ongoing challenges with respect to regulatory cooperation and coherence, and hopefully with increased mutual recognition, uh, we will get over some of the barriers. But also, um, hopefully with increased communication with different stakeholders and their involvement, once again, we will get to a point where we will see changes within the overall system. But I think just to leave you off today, I think as far as kind of final thoughts, I think my main takeaway is there is no one size fits all. We really need to pay attention to specific industries to see uh, what they're doing and get lessons from there, as well as different regional blocks to learn what they're doing, because there are good examples going on in the world that we um, in different parts of the world can learn from. Thank you so much for attending. Thanks. And thank you to the panel. Welcome.